Fish was founded in 1983 by lead guitarist Trey Anastasia, who recruited drummer John Fishman and bassist Mike Gordon while attending UVM and later adding keyboardist Paige McConnell, a music student at Goddard College. Their shared interest in bands like The Grateful Dead and Frank Zappa created a chemistry that would propel the group forward. First time we played together? For people, for an audience. Proud to see you dance it. Marshawn and Tupper Hall at UVM. We were using hockey sticks for microphone stands, and uh, we ran out of songs in, in like an hour. <laughs> and started repeating the songs, and at one point some girl came up and asked us if we were doing a flock of seagulls. That was the beginning of the end. We took a break, and they brought down a stereo from somebody's room, started cranking Michael Jackson and stuff, and weren't really encouraging us to go back on. I think, but we I did. We played our second set, and then uh, which was the same song as the first. Yeah. Which was the same set, right? We Each started set repeating. Had Proud Mary twice. Right, that's what it was. So Proud Mary. So and Total Long Cold Woman. Yeah. Long Cold Woman and Proud Mary were both played a couple times. Yeah. Long Cold Woman and Proud Mary. <laughs> but did they? Did the people like it? No, no. they hated it. No. And we were ignored, basically. No, I remember it. it culminated in the end with me screaming into the microphone at they were like trying to turn Michael Jackson louder than us and I was oh, holding right. up the check because they paid us at the oh. beginning. It was like <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. I think you paid us. You <laughs> paid us. <laughs> 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 we had um, Proud Mary. <laughs> it was like this is thriller. Proud Mary, keep on. As Fish grew, they began to play at a local bar called Nectar's. The small stage gave the band the freedom to pull off comical gags while remaining musically sound. The band covered songs by The Grateful Dead, The Almond Brothers, an original from Trey Senior Thesis Project Game Hedge, a concept album that was influenced by works like Frank Zappa's Joe Garage, The Who's Tommy, and Genesis' The Lamb Who Laid Down on Broadway. Game Hedge tells the story of a race of people called the Lizards, who once lived in harmony with nature and each other under the guidance of the Helping Friendly book. This book contained the knowledge inherent in the universe and described the path to eternal joy. One day a traveler, Wilson, enters Game Hedge, steals the Helping Friendly book and enslaves the lizards. The story's hero, Colonel Forbin, happens into Game Hedge by chance and retrieves the Helping Friendly book for the revolutionary's leader, Errand Wolf. In the end, Wolf simply replaces Wilson as the evil leader. Game Hedge is seen as both a commentary on modern religion and the cyclical nature of society. Gamehenge is Trey's senior thesis from college, and honestly, I think it's a wonderful piece of music. I mean, he talks a lot, but it's a narrative about a story, and I think it's a really cool story, too. A lot of people talk to me about how they don't like the low quality it's in, or like how lo-fi it is, you know? But like, my personal favorite kind of music is music from like the 70s and the 60s and stuff like that, so I actually appreciate it a little bit more. Gamehenge was just like full of exploration and creativity, and I kind of like that as a basis for what Fish has done over the years. Game Hedge also began the tradition of Fish's interactive songs, like Wilson, where the crowd would chant the name of the evil king between chords. Nineteen eighty eight and nineteen eighty nine were significant years for the band as they traveled to Colorado in nineteen eighty eight for a seven show tour and sold out the Paradise Theatre in nineteen eighty nine, the same venue where Oasis and the post Iggy Pop Stooges had breakthrough shows. The news of an unheard of Vermont jam band selling out the Paradise Theatre was huge and put fish on the map. It was a very gradual spreading out, and we built up this following along the way that people that liked to come and see us a lot because they knew that we would try to make every show different. Different song list, different whatever we could think of, different theatrical things. And when we left Vermont, when we left our hometown to tour a little bit, um, people would follow. And, and uh, So what happened is we built up this following just by playing. It was never really records or radio or videos or anything like that that boosted our career. It was all this word of mouth thing. So that's different um, from how it usually works in the music business. So this works out pretty well for us because our fans are very dedicated and um, over the years they, they last, you know, they're not just coming to hear one hit song, they're just coming because they don't know what's going to happen, just like we don't really know what's going to happen. 90s Fish is the epitome of energy 
I think their songs are still new to them. They haven't played them on the road like hundreds of times to where it kind of wears down on them. So they have this epic material and they're young and they're on fire and they're mastering their instruments and it's something new and I think there's a vibe that comes from that that really makes it, I don't know, it really amps me up when I listen to early 90s Fish. It's, it's, it's tight, it sounds really good. You can just hear the youth and the energy. I love 90s Fish and I love their type 1 jamming. We were just talking about it earlier but like the, they just reach a certain like glorious kind of like I guess yeah I'm peaked to their music Fish continued the trend of gathering fans through word of mouth extensively touring colleges clubs and bars throughout the Northeast performing 148 shows in 1990 and 126 in 1991 tapers followed the band amassing a collection of live recordings that made their way through Fish's fan base I always think about like as a taper as like doing a super justice because they're like letting everyone take that artist home and like so like that's all because of taper like I can listen to every show because of a taper and like that's super special to me because that's like how a community is created you know what I mean like people traded bargaining outside the venues like they bring their tapes and like if you think about it, like that's how that's the Ruby Shakedown Street like with people like coming together creating a community sharing the music like sharing the passion for the music and talking about it like that's just how friends are made like sharing that passion. In 1991, fans who had been archiving the group's concerts compiled their information forming Fish.net. Fish.net created an online platform where the Fish community could find set lists, read show reviews, and look up song statistics. It allows people to remember that experience and like even look at it like differently than the way that you know most people would. Like most people would hear Fish and they would just hear you know people doodling, soloing endlessly, but like the fans on fish.net, they analyze the songs and they like critique it. But that also really like engages <coughs> people in Fish's music, like because then like you're looking at every set list, you're looking at songs that like this net like highly recommends, so like some highlights of the shows, you're focusing on that. You're also focusing on like song gap history, you know what I mean? It like lays all these statistics out for every show and like you just focus on it a lot. I love putting on a show and just like reading through what people think of it like because some of it's just like really inspiring and they like they'll tell their stories about the show you know what I mean like you'll read someone's like like was driving through like the pouring rain for like 16 hours to get to the show and like when I got here like it was amazing like fish ripped it up so like you read like people's stories behind the show and it's like super inspiring all because of this website. As their obsessive touring schedule drew more and more fans to the scene, Fish maintained the tight audience band relationship by enacting new traditions like a Halloween set where they covered another artist's album in its entirety, beginning with the Beatles' White Album in 1994. Fish also started a New Year's Eve tradition of performing multiple days at Madison Square Garden the same year. So I grow up like right outside of New York City so like New Year's Eve shows to me are like super accessible like I can go to MSG like I can get there in 30 minutes so I've seen a couple shows. Seeing them at like the greatest arena in the world is like it's a new level like it's a tradition they've been playing there since 94 and like seeing them there and like the place is just literally suspended. So when like that crowd shake and like when that crowd's grooving like I heard them do the funkiest combo and like I don't even know, like 15 years since like 97 and the crowd was just grooving out so hard and the place was just like swaying and like the building was moving and the people were moving and it was just like something spiritual. In 1996, inspired by their early days of playing concerts on secluded farms in Vermont, Fish organized their first festival, the Clifford Ball. Get them off the highways, get them off the roads, 
see if we can uh, get them in quickly. The music was awesome and like they would ride around in carts and like talk to fans and stuff like that. So it was really cool. I was blown away by the Clifford Ball because I've never seen a live performance be so flawless. Attracting over 70,000 fans to an abandoned Air Force base in upstate New York, Fish constructed a personalized space where the band and fans could connect in a completely open environment. It's a lot of people that showed up for one band, and that's something you don't really see often. So, And they traveled all the way to the middle of is it New York, I think, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It was their first festival. It was unlike anything. And to keep like a massive energy for seven straight sets of only your music with people, like think about that, that's a special bond you create with that crowd. Like you really got to interact with the crowd of like, I think it's like 70,000 plus people and like be intimate with this whole crowd in order for them like to be interested in that seven sets of music. And like, that's what Clifford Ball is. Michael and Tara have have come to stand here before all of you because they told me you are their family. With the joining of hands and the giving of rings, I can announce to you that they are indeed husband and wife. As a special treat, Fish performed a set riding on the back of a truck through the campgrounds at 2 a.m. 1996 in particular was a special year for Fish and spirits were high as the band continued to put on monster shows. Chicks in the front row, we don't like the dudes in the front row. We pretend to like the dudes in the front row, so the dudes won't feel bad, but we're really looking out for the chicks in the front row. Well, the film crew came to see us, and they thought they would get laid. They were wrong, so wrong. That's why we wrote this song. Fish recreated the festival atmosphere again the following year with the Great Went, this time bringing 75,000 fans to the northern reaches of Maine. No, we're about three minutes ahead of schedule. Yeah, we're, we're just right fine. Actually, today is, what is today, Wednesday? Five minutes behind schedule now. Bigger than anything this little town has ever, you know, experienced before. But no one taught that to me yet. In 1997, Fish left behind the shredding guitar solos and psychedelic effects for a more textured sound, concentrating on group cohesion rather than focusing on Trey. I think later 90s Fish has a bit more sp space and dynamics to it. So deliciously funky and like. I think that's like the peak of the funk. Like that's the only way to put it, man. Like really, like it is just so fucking groovy. I don't even think Trey takes a solo. It's just like all like and all the band like working together. Late '90s is also I categorize that as like when the band starts diverging from their songs as a whole, and not just Trey going off on crazy solos and joining the band back again after his solos. Like the whole band goes down a path with their jams and they're all together straying from the, the structure of the song. While some saw this transition as a step in the right direction, Fish received backlash from critics and fans alike that were more drawn to the raging music of the early 90s. If you're gonna take a risk, sometimes you're gonna play shit, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and somebody comes and they pay their $20 and you get up there and you play shit that one time. And then they're like, you know, well, this, this, is, uh, this is terrible. These guys are urinating in the ears of the listeners and, and they're happily lapping it up. But I don't think our fans do happily lap it up. Uh, I think what happens is they get on the internet and talk about how it was a bad show.
For fish, the 20th century ended at Big Cypress Indian Reservation in Florida. This legendary eight-hour show became known as the band's second peak, the first being Clipper Ball. Following Big Cypress, Fish started to struggle creatively, not knowing where to go next after the monumental concert. As the band continued to grow, the pressures of fame weighed down on the members and friction arose between the longtime friends. All we cared about was buying better gear, making the sound better, getting the crew together and all that stuff. The, the bigness, you know, the, the fame can really destroy what you set out to do. And um, I think maybe what we have that sets us apart is that we still are friends. In 2000, Fish released Farmhouse, an album completely written by Trey and longtime friend Tom Marshall. Even though Fish remained in the spotlight, tension between the group led to a brief hiatus from 2000 to 2002. Their 2002 reunion showed promise with the release of two new albums, but issues between the group had not been solved and on May 25th, 2004, Trey announced that their August festival, Coventry, would be Fish's final shows. When it finally arrived, Coventry was a mess. Heavy rains created a mud bath that encompassed the entire campground and made travel conditions extremely difficult. Most who attended abandoned their cars on the highway and walked miles to reach the venue. Coventry was always something like I've like, just like never really paid any attention to because it was so like such a dark corner in Fish's history. You know what I mean? Trey like geeking out on stage, like snorting heroin or whatever that video that people claim he was doing in shows. I haven't watched or listened to much Coventry, and that's intentional because I've only seen one video. It was the Glide that they played, and you could just hear the crowd being like really upset and shocked at like how much Trey is messing up on guitar and like the band looks sad and it's just I don't know it's a really depressing thing because they had this great ride so far from the late 80s when they formed and they've just been killing it and killing it killing it and here they are in a festival and Trey's really dropping the ball. It seemed immortal to me until I watched some of the footage from that festival so I think of sadness. Like even though like they were at their most like dull moment, darkest hour in their history, they were able to create some like the darkest, spaciest gems because of it. The festival ended with the band members leaving in separate buses. Some would not talk again for years. Two thousand eight saw the first hope for Fish fans in years. Performing for former tour manager Brad Sand's wedding, the group decided to put together a two thousand nine spring tour. Their triumphant return to the legendary Hampton Coliseum marked a new birth for Fish. Today, the band is still reaching new heights and even put out a new album called Fuego. I like Fuego. I don't love it. I think I'd categorize it as like a fun album as opposed to like an epic life-changing album, which I honestly would call some earlier albums like truly special things that really changed the way I look at music. Once I saw the songs live, that's when I really grew to appreciate the songs in and stuff because like I can associate it with all those awesome memories of the shows. I've I've been listen, I've been going to like dead shows and further shows for like I've seen like 20 of their shows and they haven't come out with new music so I've never really heard of like an active guitar player you know what I mean so when Fish comes out of an album like this like it's really it's really powerful for me because like I'm watching this band develop like that's really new for like people in the jam band scene 
you don't really watch a band develop around this album because especially like in the my friend circle everyone I know because we came into the scene so late so like Fuego is like that album that came out like we focused on it No one else can really relate when you try to show them fish and they haven't heard it. And like you really get into the details about fish and then you meet someone who's also in it and you can just like totally geek out about things that don't even matter. Meeting someone who's just that passionate about something else is really powerful. Like it takes a certain kind of person to devote that much time into something and like music like that. So when you find that person too, like special bonds created. So I work at a cafe and I just put on music at work. <coughs> um, one time this old dude, like 60 years old, he like came up to me. He was like, is this fish? I'm like, yeah, man, you listen to fish. He's like, yeah. And it was like cool because like he's like a 60 year old white man. And I'm like this Asian, this 21 Asian dude. And like, even though we're like completely opposite, um, we just had this like kind of instant bond. There's this one time where if you remember, me and you were just driving down Girard and we were in my car blasting fish and we saw this one truck just like, kind of like, go by us in the left lane. And we saw this that he had a Yem sticker. And to the left of that was an actual fish sticker. So we rolled down our windows and pulled up to him and just like, blasted Yem and just started like screaming at him like, woo, let's go and stuff. Like, it was really cool. And he like, noticed us and like, Gave us props and stuff. It was really cool. It was a cool moment. Everyone's just kind of there, all in the same amped up like mood. They're all about to go see fish, and people are dropping acid and smoking weed and drinking beers. And I don't know. It's hard to describe. I'll never find it anywhere else than like really big jam scenes. You know, like the Dead. I'm sure had a great shakedown street. Fish has an amazing one. I don't think many other bands really can get that going. And like, yeah, so it was my second lot scene, and just like, honestly, at the time, I was super young, and it just looked like a carnival to me, like, people shouting, people stand, bands standing on top of hippie vans, like, playing music, live music, people selling all these weird looking things to me, I'm young at the time, like, someone's like trying to sell me a bowl, and I'm like, what the fuck is that shit, man, like, I had no idea, like, super, like, super weird people coming up to me, seeing the weirdest stuff, and it was just like, so appealing at the time, that all these people, like, came together randomly before a show and created this massive event. The lot scene at Merriweather was totally different, I felt. It was just like, bursting full of energy, just all these people, just really nice fans, like, some people let us, like, chill and use their, like, lawn chairs and, like, hang under their little tent because it was a really hot day. There's a tons, of, tons of fish fans and there's they come from all walks of life. You meet some really cool people and it's cool to talk about like shows that they've been to and like what their favorite version of songs were and stuff. But like you also get like the people who kind of like scammed my friends and like I don't know there's also some like just people that don't seem like they do anything but follow the fish and that doesn't seem like it's a healthy lifestyle either. Like the favorite person I've ever met at fish show was at this Randall's Island show this summer and this guy had been to like 250 shows, he was like, super, like 45, he's just being a super nice guy, he handed me a treat and said like, have a good night, like he was super good, he, I, like any show I questioned him about, he was there, like Coventry, Big Cypress, that 11 97 show, that's one of my favorites, that Boise 99 show, like he's toured with them a shit ton, and like he's still a pretty successful man, you know what I mean, like well off, and he's got dreads down his knee, he's been growing them since he's been touring with fish. It was a crazy night. We got there and like the whole day I thought it was going to rain, like storm clouds. I got there, I was like super like having a great time, you know what I mean? Like talked to this couple, I'm like, is it really supposed to rain tonight? She's like, yeah, definitely. The show's going to get rained out. I was like super bugged out about that and like, like they just came out with like, they came out with sand and they played sand and put a super ripping version. It was the first time they've ever uh, opened the sand. So they, they opened with that and like honestly like, as they like ripped that version up, the, sc the sky opened up, and like from then on, it was just an amazing, amazing show. Probably not the answer you're expecting.
because it has nothing to do with live fish at all. I think the best fish moment for me was when I listened to Rift for the first time. I had, I bought, these are, these are the headphones. <laughs> I had new, awesome, big headphones. I, these were like new and that was a whole new thing. So I was listening to music on a whole nother level. I was out at the park with my dog. Beautiful, no one's around, in the woods. I was walking around, started the album and I just listened to the whole thing with like my jaw dropped. It was so powerful to me that I knew I was like a big fish fan. Before that, I was a casual listener and it happened like that. It's like there's things going on in that album that just changed the way I looked at guitar, which is like one of the biggest things in my life. It changed the way I look at songwriting, music in general. And it was a really special moment. I'll never forget that time where I listened to Rift.